Very glad to be here. Um, I want to start with some bad news because we have 15 minutes to solve intelligence and right after us I was just told is the Prime Minister speaking. So we probably can't take any more time than 15 minutes. That seems like a very, very challenging order, but uh, we're going to give it a try anyway. So that's the bad news. <laughs> um, but what I, what I wanted to, to, to talk about is maybe we can solve intelligence in 15 minutes, but one of the things that we can do is maybe you can help us understand what things um, are coming next on the path to intelligence. So there's a set of things that work very reliably and most of the people in the audience I would assume understand them like RNNs and CNNs and we have built companies and products on top of these things. So I call them kind of mundane by now. But there's a bunch of interesting work going on and so what comes next on this path towards intelligence? So uh, of course I'm a little bit biased but reinforcement learning is an obvious choice. Uh, reinforcement learning is much more realistic from the point of view of how you obtain the data. You have a system that's just interacting with its world, getting a stream of experience, and trying to turn that stream of experience into actual knowledge and models and, and understanding, and to use it to, to plan its actions. And so we've seen some phenomenal successes. Alpha Zero is the latest one, uh, where we had the system learning from scratch by interacting uh, with its environment by playing games against itself and beca becomes a total master at its task. But of course Go is a very limited kind of task. It's very complicated, it's a strategic game, but at the same time it's a game, it's a perfect information game. We know what the rules are. Uh, the rules are not baked into the algorithm, but there's a lot of um, sort of structure there that the algorithm can leverage. So uh, I think one of the goals of current research is in fact to push this further so that such systems can interact, for example, with the natural world, so that they can interact with people and learn from that stream of interactions and really gain capability, not in just one game, but in a whole multitude of tasks. And what would you say is kind of the state here? So certain technologies are what I would say reliable. So for example, in CNNs, we kind of understand them reasonably well by now. Um, if it's an image classification task, we can estimate how much data we will need for it. Uh, we can draw learning curves. It is, it's, we can, um, in a workmanship-like fashion, very reliably build things on top of it. So in reinforcement learning, there's lots of applications in robotics, time series. There's all kinds of interesting things. How reliably does it work? Or is it very interesting but needs more work? I want to be conscious of the time element that was uh, asked before. So there are some tasks which are prediction tasks where I think we understand things very well. Uh, so we can take complicated streams of data, maybe these are physiological monitoring data or financial time series, and we can use reinforcement learning algorithms to learn predictions. This is, I think, not what first comes to mind when, when people talk about reinforcement learning, but it is where, for example, temporal difference learning originated from this problem of predict prediction over time. Um, so there we understand the theory quite a bit. Building the applications is actually fairly reliable. Um, the place where things start being interesting is the control case, where the system has to gather its own data. And that's where um, the difficulty is partly what data do I choose to see? And of course, the actions that the system does influence its experience. And I think one of the open questions for us, in fact, is this question of exploration. What is safe for a system to do? What should it do in order to, to favor its, its learning? And um, if I take you a little bit outside of your field, there's a bunch of other interesting things like GANs, for example, a, a favorite of mine. But um, what other things other than reinforcement learning do you think could be interesting building blocks that, let's say, are starting to work and become reliable so we can build reliably things on top of it? So I'll tell you some things that I wish would work. Um, one is uh, sort of uh, human agent interaction and learning by imitation, right? So uh, when babies learn, they do a lot of sort of gathering experience on their own, but also they watch the world around and they have a mom and they imitate what the mom does and what the dad does and so on and it's all very cute. But it also means that their stream of experience is kind of focused on perhaps good data. 
Um, and this is a case where there's been quite a bit of work, but we still have, I think, quite a bit of exploration to do. It's sort of in between pure reinforcement learning and more supervised learning. Um, I think also uh, paradigms where an AI works alongside a human and we figure out how to do things together uh, from the point of view of applications will become quite important. Okay. Um, so if we change tack a little bit and we take our, our charter here seriously and we have to solve intelligence in the remaining nine minutes, um, then uh, one of the questions that, that arises is, what are kind of the building blocks? There's, in my mind, two different versions of this world. One version of the world has an overarching general framework, and we're just going to solve it in one framework. The other one is there's a bunch of really interesting things, reinforcement learning being one of them. Um, it might be a collection of very, very different things for a long period of time till we figure out something better. Which of those two versions of the world do you think has, uh, is, is more likely here? So we certainly have a lot of capability, like you mentioned, for example, in convolutional neural networks. There are sort of parts of this problem that have to do with processing certain kinds of information, like visual information, that we understand pretty well. And so those are building blocks that obviously will be part of this. Reinforcement learning really is about what kind of error signal do you feed these systems? It's not about the architecture itself. It's about the training regime. And so any kind of advances that the folks in deep learning make in terms of recurrent nets, in terms of deep nets, and, and so on, GAN, if you name it, uh, you know, we're kind of watching and picking the best uh, and just feeding them different, uh, different error signals. Um, but I think there's also other developments, perhaps, that would be interesting to, uh, to try and push forward, one of them be being this area of uh, sort of unsupervised learning and, and modeling of the world uh, without reward signals, but just from the stream of experience. And there is uh, research thinking in that area, but uh, there's a lot of progress still to, to be done. Okay. Um, what do you think in our task to actually make progress on on building more and more intelligent systems that can do more and more. What sort of elements uh, should we invest in, in more? Uh, what are kind of the fundamental limits that we right now have in the research community that you're, you're, you're a part of? Um, and how can we try to, to, to address them? So what are the things that you wish you had? What are the things that you wish the community uh, had or would pay more attention to? Um, what are the impediments here? Well, so obviously uh, talent is a key ingredient, and this is one thing that uh, in academia right now we're trying to uh, build, uh, but uh, it is hard. So I wish I had more professor colleagues to work with. Um, unfortunately, there's a small pipeline right now. We're trying in various ways to get um, sort of more students involved in this type of research, but I think it's really important for us to... Uh, try and train people in these fields that understand the science, that also understand the possible space of applications, and so can work on, on both of these sides. Um, computation resources in academia are still somewhat limited, uh, certainly compared to the industry side of things, and access to data sets uh, that are of scale uh, is a bit touch and go. So it depends on the lab, depends on the, the context, and so on. And, and these are really uh, the important things, right? Talent, data, and computation. And so the more we can have of it, the better. So in, in this context, how do you view um, collaborations with large tech companies? Because very often uh, faculty end up at large tech companies. Um, and might be doing, let's say, less work in academia as a, as, as a result of it. So if we, if we take this charter seriously, trying to solve intelligence, um, how, how do you view this? On the other side, you know, these companies have amazing resources from a computational point of view. Um, how, how do you view this trade-off? So I think we're very lucky in machine learning that a lot of the large players actually have pure research labs that are very academically minded, and that share publications and share code. And so they're in the same space, essentially, as the academics. 
And from that point of view, I don't feel that the sort of transition is actually uh, sort of that cut and dry. Uh, there's really a continuum and a fluidity there. Um, I think, uh, at least at McGill, myself, my colleagues, Joel Pino, we made a deliberate choice to keep half of our time in academia and just half of our time in industry uh, in order to keep this balance and make sure that we continue uh, training students and, and have an interesting research lab on the academic side. Um, but I think it's actually really useful uh, also for our students to have this possibility to go back and forth uh, between, between these two environments because there are certain things that can only be done in industry and there are some things that are best explored in academia. Academia is perfect for curiosity-driven, pure blue sky research, whereas in industry there's always some concern that somewhere down the lines uh, thing, things will have to be uh, proven in some sense in the real world. So maybe as uh, one of the last uh, uh, avenues to go down is, um, in this community we're all very excited about deep learning and there's lots of different types of deep learning. But let's change tack a little bit. Machine learning used to use other methods before and there are certainly um, folks talking about um, uh, very drastic things. So for example, um, Abolishing backcrop, for example, is a very recent example that people have, uh, have, have talked about. And so, um, so how, how do you view this? Do you, do you think we can, are we over-indexed on a set of algorithms and we are now um, living in a space where we have the sort of echo chamber? Um, are we exploring enough things that are maybe not exactly the mainstream, but you know, most of them will fail, but some of them might actually be very, very interesting and, 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 and fruitful? How, how do you view this? So there's certainly focusing around areas where things are paying off right now, right? There's a huge community, for example, interested in GANs in the last couple of years because it's a hot new thing that seems to work interestingly. Uh, and I think this is fair for, for people to do that, but there is, at least in, among the students, there's a lot of curiosity and a lot of enthusiasm for trying different things. And so I'm confident that this will continue. And there are certainly applications where at least at the moment, deep learning would not necessarily be the method of choice. Um, so deep learning relies on a lot of data. And there are many cases where either we can simulate data or we have the web or we have sort of open sources that, that provide the information. But I do, for example, a lot of collaborations with doctors uh, where we work, work with patients. And in a clinical setting, uh, if you have 200 patients, it's great. If you're very, very, very lucky, maybe you have 1,000 patients with a particular condition, maybe 2,000 patients, but it's not really feasible to gather millions of patients because millions of people might not have a particular condition. And so that's a space in which we need to think about different ways of doing things that are perhaps more data efficient uh, than, than the focus now. So um, which other parts of the community can we fold into this effort? So one of the things, so my, my background actually is from HPC land, not from uh, deep learning land. And so in, we, we solved a bunch of interesting problems while we were solving PDEs in the past, as it turns out. And we solved a bunch of interesting problems in optimization theory uh, in the past. And there's very large bodies of work. Um, can we uh, take part of these sort of communities and kind of fold them into this effort? And if so, what do you think are the most fruitful sort of collaborations that we can do on a technical level um, to, to make progress in the field? So certainly from the side of mathematics, there's a lot of methodology that's been developed that I think is applicable to, for example, analysis of deep learning systems or analysis of reinforcement learning systems. And it's a matter of getting those folks attracted to this field and getting them to think about these problems. So certainly uh, people who do analysis of dynamical systems or people who do numerical methods who understand those things very well can help us actually provide perhaps theoretical guarantees or perhaps to, include, uh, to, to improve the, the methods that we use for training now. Um, I think from the computer science side of things, uh, there's a variety of people that we would find very useful from software engineering for sort of good code design practices all, all the way to numerical computing, uh, to uh, high performance computing and distributed computing databases folks and so on. Um, so I think 
you know, machine learning right now is, is very hot, but it really has connections to a lot of other fields in mathematics and control theory and in computer science. And so it would be very natural for us to build bridges to, to these communities. Okay. Um, we have three minutes left, and we ha still haven't quite solved intelligence yet. So um, maybe what we can do is if we meet here, I'm going to ask you to make a couple of predictions, if you don't mind. Um, and uh, I'm not going to ask you to make like 20-year predictions because that's very difficult, and I say this as an investor. Um, <laughs> uh, but if we meet here just one year from now, and uh, I, would, I, I would ask the question again of, okay, the things that didn't quite work but now are we would both agree are basically commonplace, as commonplace as a CNN where you can build companies on top of it and all of that. What do you think would be um, in one year the technology where you would say, this didn't work a year ago, but now we can reliably build intelligent systems on top of it? So that's a very interesting question and uh you know, you're making me do a very dangerous thing here. <laughs> but uh, <Sorry. laughs> one of the things that uh, I think we have some hope of seeing is essentially, for example, the same technology that's right now in AlphaZero applied to a large variety of games. I can imagine that being extended. Maybe this will mean the same architecture and algorithm working on 10 or 15 or 20 different games. If we're really, really, really lucky, maybe it means the actual same brain working on these games, that would be amazing. Even if it doesn't work at master level, but it works to some extent, I would be really happy with that. So, but certainly one architecture, one algorithm mastering many different perfect information games, I, I think we will see a year from now. Uh, from Purely a, by self-play? By self-play, Okay, yes. just to, 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 to clarify. Purely by self-play. Um, another, I think, uh, area in which we're at least hoping there will be a lot of progress is recurrent nets. I think, you know, we have some architectures. LSTMs are very popular. They're extremely hard to beat. I think there's a lot of people who are vying to, to get something better. So. And uh, um, this is, just to clarify uh, on, your, on your first statement, does this mean only for completely observable type of games or do you also mean for unobservable uh, 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 parts of it, because that would enable all kinds of other applications that you could build on top of it. Partial observability is certainly something that uh, people are thinking about. There's been very interesting advances coming from the University of Alberta from Mike Bowling's group on poker, and so extensions of that would be certainly down the line. How far they will go, we have to see. Okay, so when we meet again in one year, we're going to have the perfect poker bot uh, <laughs> powered by reinforcement learning. So we didn't quite solve in the allotted time intelligence, but maybe we can solve poker in a year. Maybe that's the thing. <laughs> that would be pretty good. Too. Oh. 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 oh, we we got an extension. So um, I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> What, 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 one question. Okay. Um, so now that we, uh, we, we, we have decided we're going to solve poker in a year, um, uh, one, one other question that, uh, um, that, uh, that's kind of near, near and dear to my, to, to my heart is, um, as we're trying to build more and more intelligent things, um, how do we get them out in the world to what I would say non-tech uh, primes. So a lot of this technology just ends up at the Googles and the Apples of this world, and you know, rightfully so, they run large <laughs> research labs. But um, but you know, some of our companies, for example, um, help uh, folks like John Deere, for example, and uh, they are not what I would say like a tech prime like a Google, for example. And so, how do we democratize this so we get more intelligence, broader distributed? So there's a lot of companies who I think are trying to uh, push sort of the research frontier uh, in a way that makes things more applicable and perhaps more turnkey. Uh, so Element AI is a case from Montreal that I'm very familiar with that it's exactly trying to uh, talk to uh, non-tech uh, companies. Um, a lot of it has to do with how well uh, do we understand these algorithms and how well do we feel that we can 
convey the information to people who are not trained in machine learning about what these algorithms can do. Uh, so, so part of it has to do with, honestly, the interfaces and the ease of using things uh, rather than necessarily algorithmic advances. Okay, thank you.